Good evening. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Archivists of Central Texas second installment of Art and Archives. My name is Rachel Winston and I will be hosting our discussion today. I am so excited to be here and really glad to see so many familiar folks in the Zoom room tonight. So to get us started, um, I know many of us here in this virtual space, myself included, are tuning in from Austin. So I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge the ground that we're on and recognize the Tonkawa, the Panapache, Comanche, Isleta del Sur Puebla and other indigenous peoples who were dispossessed of their homelands. If you'd like to contribute your own land acknowledgement, whether you're in Austin or beyond, I invite you to do that in the chat. I want to welcome our esteemed guests today, Adrian Aguilera and Samanche. Tonight, tonight we'll be in conversation um, between the two of them. And before we begin our wonderful program, I do have a few shout outs and general announcements to share with everyone here. I first want to thank and acknowledge the planning committee, Kelly, Nikki, Aaron, Lauren, uh, thank you all for the work and time you've put into making tonight possible. And of course, this would not happen without the support of the Summerlee Foundation. And folks, after an extended pandemic hiatus, the Austin Archives Bazaar is back. I'm so, so happy to share. For those of you who may not know, the Archives Bazaar will be back and take place this coming Sunday, April 24th from 12 to 4 p.m. at the Austin Beer Garden Brewing Company or AGBG. No, a, yeah, ABGB. I always get those letters confused in South Austin. This year's bazaar will feature a fantastic lineup and the popular speaker series, ser speakers stage featuring a special guest MC, Chet Garner from Austin PBS's The Day Tripper. There will be 20 archival repositories from all over Central Texas, as well as a preservation station, an audiovisual peep show, goodie bags, door prizes, and more. It is sure to be incredible. Uh, for more information, you can visit austinarchivesbazaar.org. So I thank you for your attention um, and I am very excited to get our program started. To do so, we will take a look at a video, vid, excuse me, video feature and then transition into our conversation. Uh, so with that, Nikki, I think we're ready to roll tape.
Um, hey, I'm Semente, born Amanda Caroline de Oliveira Pereira. Um, I'm originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and when I was six, we immigrated to Massachusetts, so that's where I was raised on the East Coast, and came to Austin, Texas for grad school six years ago. So I'm also a PhD candidate in the African African Diaspora Studies program, currently writing my dissertation, which is on art as a practice of community building, healing, and basically a way to access freedom. Um, so. My work kind of comes together from the visual art place, the performance place, and it kind of tells various stories, right? And I'm combining the theory that I learned in black studies, the history that I carry in my ancestry and in my family, and um, what I want to communicate to the world. So that's my work. And in my studio, you'll see works of art that are by me, and you'll also see works of art from friends and from other um, artists here in Austin and that came out of a project called the Green Snake Art House where I threw various events and we got together and created art together. So I'll, some of my work is about the individual art making process and some of it is about community and collaboration and how we can come together to create new worlds. Hi there, my name is Adriana Aguilera and I'm a visual artist. Uh, I live in Austin, Texas, and I work with all kind of materials and, ma and mediums to produce the work that I do. I research the sense that resides in materials within an interest in scientific observation, cultural history, and social issues. I select, I selectively remove discarded visual materials as in text, images, and anything that has the potential to have another connection from the original context. By removing materials and their original contexts and uses, I hope to generate a deeper dialogue about our relationship within our physical and cultural spaces in which we coexist. By employing the atmospheric conditions of light or wind within my installations, I combine my interest in considering the natural world and dynamic means of presenting information. Ultimately, I focus on print media and it in its powerful role as evidence of knowledge of the natural world. My work attempt to deconstruct the monolithic cultural meanings produced through the process of reproduction with the intention of activating a sense of disarranged identities. That was amazing. It was so cool to get a little glimpse of y'all studios, Samanchi and Adrian, since we can't physically be there these days. So thank you for um, graciously inviting our team into your spaces. So to get us started, I am really interested in knowing generally about your experience working in archives or with archival collections. Uh, and you all touch on this both in your uh, interviews, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about ways you might have been influenced by your personal family archives. So things like photographs, home movies, letters, artifacts, things like that. I can start us off. Uh, thank you so much for having us here and for getting a little glimpse into what we do. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, my first experience uh, working in the archives was actually in Salvador in Bahia, um, going back to Brazil as a study abroad student um, during my undergrad um, at Brandeis. So I was not yet at UT, but I was working on my senior thesis. And so that was my first time actually like going into an archive archival space and having to like look through things very carefully and learning that process. Um, and then the, my second experience was um, in 2016 with the um, New York Public Library Research Fellowship that I received at the Schomburg Center. And um, one of the pieces that y'all saw in that video, The Priestess, is actually originally a photograph by, um, by Chester Higgins that I found while I was looking through. And I have many more photographs that I hope to one day also also paint and find ways to um, kind of create into art. Um, yeah, those were my main experiences with that. And then now with my dissertation project, my archive and my data is my own work and also collaborations that I've done here in Austin with other artists and those artists work, some of which you also saw in the video. Um, so my archive now has become a lot more kind of um, 
just quotidian and um, work things that are part so journal entries art that is created while you're processing a certain life experience or something maybe not the final product but maybe the sketches that led up to something so I'm kind of investigating um, a lot of that kind of data now Hi everyone, um, thank you so much uh, first uh, to the Austin Archives uh, committee to put together this event and to invite us uh, to me and to Semenchi and to, uh, and to talk about our practice and how those relates to uh, our archives and archives or archives in general. Um, I would say that, uh, I don't know, since my practice is uh, kind of like a conceptual and it's always kind of changing the form. I feel that one of my inspirations originally about archives is being, as uh, Rachel mentioned, kind of related to family. I remember always looking to, I don't know, the photographs from all my families, and I was the only one who uh, continued asking for those photos, asking for where are those, uh, just because uh, the memory that I recorded, kind of like in my personal memory about looking at these photos from different times from my family, <laughs> the host just mute me, sorry. Uh, um, I was saying, uh, thinking about that, uh, considering those memories that I had recorded, um, I kind of keep it up on my kind of uh, thoughts about how I can bring it up to my practice in the future. Um, I also, besides being an artist, I'm also a professional, a museum of working as a museum for. Uh, Professionals as a museum, working for archives and records as a mostly as an art handler and also as a a, a, a registrar for exhibitions. That give me some uh, really insights about how to work with uh, delicate materials, with historical materials, but also give me the the idea about uh, all this uh, immense information that is just sitting in archives and how me as an artist, uh, how we can, I can actually take advantage of, of that information to bring it back. I love that. And I think it's really, I hear kind of between both of you, the importance of kind of being in community, whether it's with your family or um, your, your, your folks in your town, your city, um, and even colleagues in the workplace and how that affects how you approach archives and think about these physical materials that are sometimes found in archives, but also are very influential in the work that you do. That was really beautiful. Thank you. So my next question to both of you, um, and then if, if you're okay with it, why don't we do some ancient Adrian again? Um, so art is often a reflection of or reaction to politics, culture, and history. So it makes sense that local archives should be expanding their collection scope to include archives of artists or working with artists on how to better document their work and creative processes for their personal archives. How would you like to see archives better support artists in the community and what would that look like to you? Um, there are, that's a, such a great question. Um, I think there are so many ways that we can start those collaborations. I think one of them would be purchasing artists work and having it actually be physically part of archives, um, especially if that art is really telling a story about that community, that time and place and what, it, um, what what is needing to be expressed and documented and remembered about a certain group of people. I think that supporting researchers who are also doing kind of localized work and making sure that they're in collaboration with artists, like um, bringing those into the archives as much as possible um, would be really, really awesome. And documenting the process, like I was mentioning early, earlier, like maybe um, instead of focusing on the final product, really trying to start uh, archiving, how do people arrive at solutions? Like what are the working strategies um, that creativity allows us to find that brings us to solving localized issues that can be also very, you know, global issues. So how are artists using their creativity to do that and really making, finding ways to document that process, I think would really uh, start to 
kind of enrich in the archives in those ways. Yeah, I would add that also that, uh, as Samantha said, that paying attention and looking at uh, what the community has been done as in artists who are uh, folks that might not have uh, uh, the, uh, the experience to really uh, uh, conserve and to kind of keep it safe, their work, uh, I think is, uh, is kind of an important kind of labor, I guess, from um, in a way, uh, collections, uh, uh, private collections in town, mostly institutional collections wouldn't say wouldn't say that wouldn't actually needed to work in to identify uh, these artists that in collections that might still uh, in town and that might not be kind of protected or 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 being keeping safe. Um, but I wouldn't say that also working with uh, all young folks that are artists and people who are uh, continue working. Um, I wouldn't say that keeping them in the loop about how their collections and their works can also be donated or archived and how uh, keeping using best practices for uh, handling work and, and keeping safe work as in a storage work might be a first initial uh, assessment for keeping that work alive and keeping uh, that information available for, for later. Um, I wouldn't say that those are things that are uh, they're possible to do uh, uh, in current times as well. Yeah, I one of the things that I appreciate this question is that it highlights part of our reason for even being here today that folks so often don't think art is not one of art isn't typically one of the first things people think about when they envision themselves doing archival research or being in a repository. You know, most often folks are thinking about old documents, rare books, things that are aged and dusty and, and well-loved and things like that. But I, I work at University of Texas and when I have, especially undergraduate, lower division undergraduate students come visit the archive and I'll bring out artworks, pieces of art and it it's never fails. They're always so surprised that the archive has art. And it's like, well, why not? It's human expression, just the way someone would write. It's it's another form of, of communication. Um, anyway, that's my answer to the question. No one asked, but. <laughs> if I may, because it actually makes me think um, yeah. the opposite too could be really awesome, like welcoming artists, local artists into the archives and having like maybe like a night in which it is specifically geared for artists mm -hmm. to come look through specific topics. Um, I know that in the summer you welcomed in, us into the Benson for that short workshop um, and looking at those um, images, there were some magazines from Brazil of like the, from the 90s and there was some like just cultural magazines, like maybe kind of like a Teen Vogue version of like Brazilian. Asha, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and looking at that for me was so beautiful and so enjoyable. And my creative brain was working faster than I guess my like scholar research brain because it was connecting to like, how can this be recreated as art? It, I, my mind was going immediately to that. And so how can we maybe welcome artists to look through archives, um, maybe who are not affiliated to institutions like UT, but just who wanna be inspired by the histories of things that they're connected to. That is brilliant. And if I can ask a follow-up. So now uh, we're going on this path now, Samantha. Adrian, please join us too. So as visual artists, when working with archival materials, do you find, is it mostly visual materials that kind of get your wheels going or are, like do textual, are you inspired by textual materials? I saw the, the Black Panthers um, 10 point program on one of your works, so I'm just curious, are there types of materials or works that tend to be more inspiring um, to you in your in your work? That's such a good question. It's not just the visual. Um, there is a piece that was that I made called Salve Yemanja that's also in the video, I believe, shortly. It's um, Yemanja kind of standing with her arms out and it's yeah. like a that piece was inspired by scenes of subjection by Sadia Hartman and then that in combination with me seeing the image that is often portrayed in like um, Brazilian rep representations of Yemajau which is a very very pale skin white white passing, white uh, Yemanja that is really not accurate to her being African de Orisha. 
Um, so I wanted to recreate that, but my mind was also, it was the very beginning of grad school <laughs> and we were taking our, our black studies theory courses. So I had just read scenes of subjection and I could not get the details of how the violences were committed, um, against black female bodies and how that the erasure is a continuation of that. So that visual painting came from a text and also uh, like looking at something from the past combined and the 10 point program as well. I painted the words um, so the front is just the image of the panther and there's some glitter in there because I'm kind of adding like this modernized like my own <laughs> my own joys right there too mm -hmm. like there's joy in black liberation the black panthers were not asking for anything beyond like what is human should be you know human uh, rights and so that's why on the back I have the 10 point program because I want people to actually know what it was that they were asking for and as opposed to just knowing like the stereotypes of what the Black Panthers were so you know it's kind of a combination it really whatever is getting my wheels turning and and really like I can't stop thinking about that's what ends up inspiring me that is so cool thank you um, I guess I would say that in my case, it's more visual, but also uh, part of uh, recent research that I did at the Austin History Center. Uh, to me, I was also looking for uh, text-based uh, material, sort of information that comes from newspapers, uh, writings, uh, letters, information that couldn't couldn't make me to uh, to look to locate them mostly in a physical space. Uh, the visual photos, the photographs, the, the visual materials, the photographs were the most uh, clear that it was going to do that. It was going to show me a, a location. It was going to show me a specific time uh, within just the the, the image, right? Um, so to me, it was uh, I'm, I've been more. Uh, definitely uh, focus on uh, visual material. Though within this last break that I just mentioned, which is a, a AR, a argumented reality experience with archival uh, photographic materials. After being working on this project, I actually been thinking about uh, using audio as well to in a future idea, just by thinking about how then there might be audios that relates to the location. And, and how that makes a, a connection to me within the history, within the information, the context, the content, the content, and you know the the, the experience of, of kind of travel on time and being there. Um, I wouldn't be able. To, I, I think I will be able to do that. I guess in the future, within uh, finding and researching um, audio uh, uh, records materials. I love that. Just thinking about the whole environment of materials at um, at our disposal because they're in repositories and seeing how those connect to your creative processes. Amazing. I'm so inspired. So I will transition to another question. Uh, and so over the past few years, there has been a push in the archives and library profession to practice reparative description. And by rep reparative description, I mean um, an, an effort to remediate or update, contextualize outdated or harmful language that is used to describe underrepresented community members and their histories in archival collections. And this ultimately creates greater access to these collections, right? Because things are documented as they wish to or should be described. How have your experiences been in researching historical documents? Have you seen any gaps in the records? And how has this, this kind of your process of, of searching informed your art? Why don't we do Adrian and then yeah. the main time? Yes, that sounds great. Um, I would say that from the last research looking for uh, uh, photographs, uh, visual material. It was a little bit hard because I was uh, particularly looking for uh, 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 BIPOC uh, uh, people on the photographs as my main protagonist in the photos. Um, and I was looking at them to be also located on the on the east side of Austin. Um, and I wouldn't think that uh, because the context and the history of this place makes it to not have much materials as 
I will, I've been looking and in, 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 in searching uh, just for just for for my eyes, I guess for my my own personal interest on archives that are in Chicago or in New York, I get to find out much more materials all over the place, not necessarily on a specific location, but I get to find out that in Austin, that was a, a, a little bit of a problem to me to identify uh, BIPOC folks in photographs and to identify them also on the east side. Um, I think that is uh, uh, not necessarily an issue. I wouldn't say that it's just more the historical facts about uh, the the documentation and the and whatever has been preserved and conservated at archives and what people have donated is what what was available. I know that that is not the only archive in town. Uh, that was my main archive for my research, and I still be I was still being able to. Uh, going through a lot and being able to find materials that works for for my idea for my project, um, and yeah, I guess one of my um, I wouldn't say that my my impulse about uh, archives is about how to make present, how to have some physical present in a way, and I thought that uh, working with photographs, placing them in the location. In, a, in the real location where those photographs were taken, um, I was gonna be able to, to make history uh, present beside uh, a record or a, or a document that has to have several you know, uh, states as in physical, uh, digital, and existing repositories as well, but also how do I make that you know, beside information and, and, and just uh, uh, some content that exists in part of an archive, how do I make that be physical present? That was one of my, my, my ideas and interest in how I approached this last research. I will say that I have not had too many experiences um, as you're describing of like really encountering gaps. I feel like because of the, the type of data I've been using in my recent research and the ways in which I encountered data at Schomburg, which was kind of just like, I had access to it and I was I still haven't fully used the data that I accessed. It wasn't for anything specific. Um, I will say that what I, it's kind of the opposite where I feel like what is in the archives, like there are gaps in our cultural and social knowledge of the past and like looking and having um, the privilege of the access into archives at such a young age, like in my early twenties, it really helped me to see how much um, a lot of people are missing in terms of the information about our people and, and who we are, right, and whatever that means for, for your identity. Specifically, I was looking through archives that show people of the African diaspora in Latin America throughout um, um, like in the early 19th century and just these different experiences that I feel like a lot of people don't know are such a huge part of history and was such a huge demographic. So it's kind of like my answer is just a little flip flop. And it's just thinking through like, how can we bring the archives um, out more into public spaces in some way where that information gets to people who may not be linked to institutions and they may not be sitting there in the room, like looking through many files to see it. One of, one, one of those answers for me is definitely art, which is exactly why I, I painted what I saw and I wanted to like take it out of that box and, and put it with the glitter, with the 3D jewelry, like out in a way that we can remember her and see her, who, who this woman was. Yes, I, I love the way that you, both for both of you, your work reimagines these items in the archive. And I think in a lot of ways, that's why they're there, right? As an archivist, my work is to preserve things so that in the contemporary moment, we're able to access them and reimagine in, in whatever way is appropriate for the context, right? Whether it's for the work you're doing, the scholarship, the art practice, genealogy, whatever, um, having access to that really kind of allows for that reimagination. So my next question, there are many internal and external motivations for creating visual and performance-based work. How would you describe the local history of your city? And you can use any city. I know y'all have lived all over the world. Um, so your city as a motivator for creating and showing work in the community. 
And let's stick with, let's keep with Adrian and then Samantha. Yeah, um, well, as uh, as an artist who emigrate from Mexico, living in the um, in the place that I am, or whatever I, I, I am, in the sense of um, where I'm working, makes more sense to me to think about uh, how do I relate and how my practice can also make a, a change. Um, I feel that first art experience um, as a as a participant of whatever kind of we grow up within our communities and how do we uh, uh, acknowledge history, for example. I would say that some of my sort of uses are to make kind of, at times a critique, sometimes to comment. At times it's just also to inspire, you know? Um, I like to think that art inspires people to think and to reflect. Um, and at times within all those purposes, I feel that, uh, working within the within this city with Austin makes more sense to go back into the history and try to, I don't think I'm making any justice, but I'm trying to think that I'm making some uh, reflection and some acknowledgement uh, for, for, for those materials and for those uh, um, uh, kind of information or content that we get to appreciate and have uh, safe at the Austin History Center. Uh, to me, was also the context of how do I think about making people to go to public spaces? You know, how do I do not send them to an, an indoor space when we might still be on on pandemic? Uh, but also, how do I blur the idea about what do we think about the physical space, the public space, and and the historical space in which, uh, of course, is uh, archives and history centers. Uh, kind of conservate and have their like a, I always think that they are like a tons of time kind of concentrated on one space, just by the the the, the ranges of information and the kinds of things that get to be uh, uh, protected and saved. So I wouldn't think that for me the city in which I am makes more sense to go uh, in into it more when uh, no history is perfect, I guess, and also uh, how do art and how technology in my case using argumented reality can make some uh, acknowledgement and bring back into this kind of physical world in this contemporary world, um, historical information, historical materials. Um, I would say that my work has become very influenced by Austin um, and the creative space that is here um, with other black and brown artists in the city. Um, you started the question with like, there are many motivations. I would say my motivation for like really engaging as a public artist and, and, and taking that seriously as opposed to just doing it for myself. Um, when I was, when I moved here in Austin or within the second year of living here was really because I felt very, very alone. <laughs> and I was truly, truly struggling with being a graduate student who is an artist and who needs needs this outlet and um, like a space of creativity in order to function well and community because I didn't know anybody here and I really was uh, it was like school home reading you know writing papers and that was it and it didn't it, I wasn't feeling good my mental health wasn't doing well and so it was actually this is like play right here that's down here um, which is Conflama by Sharon Bridgeforth it was like that's kind of a sad rainy day and I pulled myself up and I saw the audition like on a Facebook post and I was like all right I guess you're I guess you're going like pull yourself up you can't just be sad at home by yourself so like I went and it was that was my first uh, performance here in Austin um, since and my first performance since undergrad which had been like two years before that and from there, it kind of just branched out. I had kind of re-engaged with my capoeira practice and was training consistently as well. Um, and then visual art kind of came out of like getting to know people and they, they came, we would come over my space and I usually have my art up and they're like, why don't you sell that? Like, you know, there's a lot of vendor markets in Austin, like there's Melanated Marketplace. There are a lot, like they were like, it would be very easy for you to make this a practice and also to help you sustain because I was always struggling financially, you know, especially in the first few years of grad school, keeping myself afloat. So people were like, go sell your art. <laughs> like, It's pretty good. You should do it. So from there, I really started investing in my art practice in a new way from this support that I received from people here and the accessibility of participating in events and getting into shows and being able to kind of grow in that way as an artist it was like the city embraced me in that way and I was extremely grateful for it and so 
I think that now my work is in how can these collaborations um, continue extending in a way that I can also give back to this space and help to create artist spaces and opportunities through the work that I'm continuing to do. Because ultimately I came here already attached to an institution. I came here as a graduate student at UT, which is a unique privilege that a lot of the artists in my community do not have, especially with finding stable jobs that pays for your for your life as you're creating art and such. Like I had that through grad school. So now that I'm finishing, I want to really continue to include that in my career and make sure that there are always spaces where artists can get paid and can and can you know grow as artists and keep developing their practice. Hey Rachel, I want to add that uh, based on your uh, thinking about again uh, again about your question and how do we get to be influenced about archival work with all kinds of mediums. I was just remembering thinking about some specific friends that I get to have made here in Austin. And they actually come, I was thinking about this friend, you might know that I'm talking about that dancer that actually works with archives uh, as in thinking uh, part of uh, part of his performance, part of the dance that that, that that he does, is actually based on 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 researching archives as well. Part of that too, um, I wouldn't say that uh, the history of, of uh, what I have seen in town with with performance artists as well. I wouldn't think that some of them actually are coming from a, a, a an idea of researching or working with archives in order to recreate not necessarily dances but to create like a counter narrative stories uh, that actually fully put sense with working with all different kind of archival records as well too. Oh, wow. Y'all, that was a very personal question. And I thank you for your honesty and vulnerability in sharing um, your motivations and, and how, how archives and art affects you as a person. So thank you. Thank you for that. So this is, kind of fun, right? Um, I am so pleased to be able to be in this space with you all and um, speaking on behalf of everyone here, right? It was so great to hear more about you and your work. First, how do we follow and support you? And second, can you talk about any current projects or future projects that are coming? And we'll flip it this time. So we'll go back to Samanchi and then Adrian. Thank you so much. That was such a wonderful conversation. Um, you can find me a couple of different ways. Um, my email is pretty simple. It's art by Semenchi, my name, S-E-M-E-N-T-E at gmail.com. And then um, I'm also on Instagram and I have two different pages. One is art by Semenchi with an underscore and visual. And the other is also art by Semenchi underscore performance. So they're kind of, um, once you pull one up, you kind of pull them both up. So that's helpful. Um, and um, what I'm working on now, so I'm also an after school sculpture teacher for this amazing program called Totally Cool, Totally Art, which is a part of the Austin yeah, Parks and Recs department. Everyone smiles when they hear this program because it's wonderful and I see a heart going up. So yes. Um, so our student show, our end of season student show just opened up at Do the Doherty Art Center um, and it will be up until April 28th, and that is also our closing night when the students will receive prizes and, and like also be able to take their work home. So that's really a great day to come by. Um, I think it's a Thursday evening, April 28th, um, and that'll be the last day for the show. So if you can't make it that day, please come by and see their work. It's foam sculpture, so it's subtractive sculpture. We use power tools, we paint, and we also created seven large scale pieces in addition to their little ones that they work on on their own. And they're massive like there are seven huge projects that we've been working on since the fall it's it's pretty cool to see um, so I welcome you all to come to that and then please stay tuned I have a couple different series of works that I am painting on my own working on individually uh, one is going back to that archive from the Schomburg that I that I mentioned and working with those photographs again um, as well as kind of a landscapes in Austin piece so I'm going I'm setting up my easel in different places in nature and I'm going to be working on a series there. I started the first one this past weekend. It was great. Um, so yes, please be on the lookout for those. Wow. Okay. Yes. And I'm really intrigued by this idea of massive sculpture. So um, 
I challenge everyone in this space to beat me to the Doherty Arts Center because I want to see those in person. <laughs> I will Andrea, definitely go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you guys will get, you can find me, find my work at uh, adrianaguilera.com. Uh, currently, I have uh, this AR project uh, that I will actually post on the chat, the website. Uh, the project uh, includes a, a website for the folks that do not have a, a, a smartphone. Uh, the web, the work works, works with a, a, a smartphone, especially with an iPhone. Um, it's a free app and allows you to visit uh, 10 locations over East Austin and experience around 20 around 22 photographs um that's the current project is still open up to april 30th um uh, after that i think i'm taking a little break for the summer i have a residency in alfred new york uh part of a bipoc residency uh, i'm thinking of talking with them about uh, how much access i have to archives there uh, it looked like it's in the summer, so it looked like at the school gets into a different state, more more low key, less stuff. So I'm still figuring out what I will be doing there, but I'm excited to be in Alfred University this summer. Uh, once I'm back from the summer, uh, I'm I'm having a an upcoming show at a place uh, called Call Lab. It's on the east side as well, and that is going to be my free solo show in town. Uh, that opens in September. So I uh, will keep you guys posted about it. Congratulations to you both. You are out Thank here you. doing it. It is so wonderful to see. So before we head into audience Q&A, I want to open things up. I've been asking you all lots of questions. I'm wondering if you have questions for each other or even questions for our audience of friendly archivists. Um, allowing space to turn the tables, if you will. <laughs> Adriana, I do have a question for you. Yeah. It's about materiality, because looking yeah. at your work, there are so many different types of material that you use. Um, what, what do you work with? Um, and uh, kind of what is your process with that? And then I also want to ask you a little bit about like futurism. Like, do you look at, do you look at your work from this like futurist lens or is it, um, cause that's how I read, I'm reading the aesthetic, but I'm wondering how, yeah, do you label it that way? Um, well, yeah, I would say that my, I've been kind of calling my work or uh, my practice, uh, multi-form just because it changes the form, but also within that, I, I mean, in that the medium changes as well. Um, I normally do not start with the medium. I do not start with the, with the, with the form. I do not know what form will be, and I don't know what medium I would choose. Then um, I have a couple of ideas that I'm researching. And then once I have, I don't know, a more clear idea of which materials might do the representation of what I'm looking, then I'm start testing. Uh, sometimes in my practice, I need to hire people. I, I uh, ask for different people to do different stuff and I pay their, their labor, their work, just because they may be a service that I know uh, I'm not a, um, I'm not qualified for it, and I might not have the tool to do it. So working within those kind of parameters, then I get to collaborate with other folks. I get to hire people. I get to uh, find materials that might not be fully available here, and I need to research them somewhere else. I also work with materials that are fully available here, but they don't need to be not, nothing expensive or nothing complicated. Um, I wouldn't say that part of the process about my work is also uh, there is. Uh, there is this idea about that the end, at the end, the result need to create an experience so people can take it with them without needing to buy it, uh, without needing to acquire it. So there is this idea about when people will come and, and be in front of my, one of my works, they will actually get to have a, a moment within like a personal moment, basically. The, the experience get to happen when they activate the work, when they come and find what is engraved on an acrylic piece or find what those these things that are moving around of a gallery, what they are doing. Um, it's all about questioning. It's all about um, uh, making people to think a little bit in a way. So I do not feel that I answer all the questions and I don't feel that I'm fully making full statements, but I'm actually proposing things that uh, let people think and reflect on the stuff. Um, uh, what else was your part of the question? I think maybe I answered everything you meant. That was super cool. 
um second part of the oh future like, oh future reason um i wouldn't say that i have read and i respect the the vision and the work that comes from from that specific kind of uh kind of informing ideas and informing our time as well as in a way to think the future looking look into the past i like to think in that way um i still feel like i'm still learning about uh uh, futurism and actually mostly about Afrofuturism, just because the term specifically attends to to uh, Black folks and in a, in attends the way that not just the future is seen but also how the past is seen. Um, it is so inspiring just to 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 acknowledge and to know about this specific uh, way of thinking, uh, just because it definitely creates a, a totally uh, hope for for the future in my in my personal opinion. You. Wonderful. So I would like to invite anyone in our space today, if you have questions, um, please, you can feel free to use the chat. You can also um, unmute and ask um, yourself too. We'd love to see you. Any questions from our audience to our wonderful panelists today. And if not, that's cool because you all both gave us your contact. We know how to follow you. Oh, we have something coming in in the chat. Uh, let's see here. So Samanshi, you mentioned being inspired by Sharon Bridgeforth. Shout out to Sharon Bridgeforth. We all love her and miss her being in Austin. Who are other artists you both are inspired by? Thank you, Kelly. That is a great question. Um, uh, yes, I love Sharon Bridgeforth's work. i um, super grateful to also call her a mentor and really be continuing to develop like how, how her work, how I feel like my work is kind of a continuation and just in, in, in line with her work. Um, yeah, I've uh, so this year I've been the uh, Weatherford University Engagement Fellow at the Blanton Museum. So I have a whole bunch of artists on my mind right now. Um, I've been able to quite also be in the archives in that way, but teaching with the art in the museum, which is amazing. Um, I got to teach with the Kwame Brathwaite ex exhibition, Black is Beautiful, right at the tail end as it was coming down. It was so amazing. Um, Cedric Huckabee's work, um, Suzanne Bocanegra also was super amazing to see her video and Congratulations. Luis Jimenez had a show that was mind blowing as well as a solo exhibition. Um, it's like the whole downstairs. Currently, we have an Oscar Munoz show, and I'm feeling very inspired by his work right now, um, teaching with it and just developing um, different creative pedagogies with his work, which is also already very non traditional and creative. Um, Makita Huja had a really beautiful piece parade that I am constantly thinking about, even though it's not up anymore. Um, those are some of mine. Um, locally, there's a lot of people uh, as well who, who I'm inspired by. Um, in my community, there were some pieces by Hida Azadi. Um, there were some pieces in the video um, by an artist named Len. Um, yeah, there's uh, Lakeem Wilson's work is really impactful as well. Um, there's a lot of people in Austin as well whose work I'm very inspired by. Um, I would say that I, I've been looking and thinking about these artists that I can mention that sort of inspired me, or I find out that in their practice, they've been actually um, using archives. And those, I would mention a few that I uh, I really like uh, looking at them just because their practice is also so uh, eclectic and diverse and actually makes a totally sense. Uh, the use of archives and the use of the history and the use of all this kind of uh, historical information. Uh, I would say that some of the ones that I really love about how they've been working with archives, I would say uh, Adrian P Piper, um, Carl Walker, uh, Mark Bradford, 
to mention a few, I, I know that there are many other folks that might not be in the same group, like Mark Dion, but all these folks kind of like inspire me about how the visuals works, how the how the collection, how the, you know, like the, uh, the, the, the presenting back the work in a totally different form. Uh, they really do uh, amazing conceptual work that, uh, their, their archival part is is just the beginning of a of a of a deeper conversation, um, and I'm very into how they they are you know uh, very successful uh, working with historical content and actually bringing it back and making it so uh, contemporary. I'm inspired just hearing about y'all's inspiration. I feel like I have some homework to do looking up some of these folks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Samantha, you have a lovely shout out in the chat from Melissa, who had a chance to see you in action at the Blanton. Thank you, Melissa. I'm glad that you were there and, and thank you for your feedback. I really appreciate it. This time together has been such a warm, bright light on an otherwise cold, gloomy day. So thank you again, Adrian and Samanche, for being here and for being so welcoming to us and in inviting us into your physical space, right? Our film, our film crew, but then also getting, uh, um, letting us kind of get a sense of who you are and the work that you do in a personal way. Uh, we don't take it for granted and, and really appreciate you. I do want to just let everyone know that if you want to go back and see this again, if you want to share it with your friends and family and colleagues, it will be posted to the Archivists of Central Texas website. And another reminder about the Archives Bazaar that is coming up on Sunday. I think Sunday could be a perfect day. You go to the Doherty Art Center, you go to the Archives Bazaar, you could do both on one day and have quite the Sunday fun day. I want to thank all of, oh, we have another question. Uh, the Austin History Center would love to work with both of you again um, in putting some sort of artist um, community event together. We've got some great ideas going from today. This is just a launching point. Ah, yes, so this video, in addition to being on the Archivist of Central Texas website will also be available on YouTube. We love access. So thank you again, the Archives Bazaar on Sunday. We look forward to seeing you all there. Samanche, Adrian, I welcome you all to share. If you have any closing thoughts or last words you'd like to share, please, please do. Just a big thank you to everyone who helped put this together. And thank you so much for inviting us. It was a really wonderful experience. And I, I really look forward to uh, this opportunity and anything else that we can collaborate on. Um, I want to say it's kind of like a part of us still in the conversation, still thinking about what we were just talking about. Um, I want to say that uh, I, I really appreciate the, the help that I, I got from the Austin History Center and specific from uh, their room staff, uh, as in people who are here, Jennifer and Vanessa. Um, I want to really uh, 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 say thank you to them right now here, but also I want to say that uh, kind of the, the, the idea that I have about Kind of like at the power of 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 archive of of, of the archives of or archiving, um, I think is to kind of like a whole is to hold memory, and I appreciate that Austin has the Austin History Center and an amazing staff to help the community. Thank you, you all. I love it. There is so much love in the room tonight. Thank you again. It was a pleasure to be with all of you today. And I look forward to the next time we're together, hopefully in person, but if, if not, that's cool too. We know we can make things happen on Zoom. Everyone take care and thanks again for tuning in. Thank you. Thanks everyone.